Good mornings, I'm Chris Oaks, and coming up today, time is running out. The special healthcare.gov open enrollment period for those who lost coverage due to a pandemic furlough or layoff ends soon. We have what you need to know in advance of the August 15th deadline. Perhaps an even more immediate concern for those still reeling from the financial impact of the pandemic, expiration of the federal eviction moratorium over the weekend. Are there any options left for those being forced out of their homes? And it's time to ditch the sweatpants and let go of the loungewear. We have what you need for back to school as classes reopen later this month. This is the Good Mornings Podcast Edition for Monday, August 2nd, 2021. National Ice Cream Sandwich Day today. That sounds like a winner. Also, it is Dinosaurs Day and National Coloring Book Day. If you're looking for a reason to celebrate... So uh, the first things you need to know this morning, the most interesting and buzzworthy stories to start your day. It appears that Sarah Palin is coming, is making a political comeback after being everywhere for a time after she shot to fame as the vice presidential nominee in 2008. Sarah Palin has largely been out of the headlines in recent years. But uh, the former Alaska governor suggested last week that she might run for Senate in the state of Alaska, against the Republican incumbent, Senator Lisa Murkowski. Right Wing Watch reports that uh, Palin said at a gathering, if God wants me to do it, I will. And that's a quote. She went on to say that uh, you guys better be there for me this time, because a lot of people were not there for me last time, referring to the 2008 election Uh, which she and John McCain lost to Barack Obama. Uh, There is already another Republican challenger to Murkowski for that Senate seat. That is Alaska Department of the Alaska Department of Administration Commissioner Kelly Chibaka. Is that how you pronounce it? Chibaka. (laughs) It sounds like a Star Wars character, doesn't it? Uh, Anyway, Sarah Palin said she had never heard of her. But uh, former President Donald Trump has endorsed Ms. Chewbacca, uh, wanting to unseat Murkowski for voting to convict him during his second impeachment in the wake of the uh, January 6th uh, Capitol riot. So the drama in Alaska continues. I don't know, Sarah Palin making a comeback. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? If you are a uh, Republican political watcher, you know, it probably could go either way. Uh, Speaking of politics, former President Barack Obama will be hosting his 60th birthday party on Martha's Vineyard this coming weekend with a reported 475 people on the guest list. This, of course, even as COVID-19 is surging again, driven by the Delta variant. So is this the right time? Some have said this may not be the right time, may not be the best look for the former president um, uh, the the president under which the current president served as vice president to be holding a big, huge bash with close to 500 guests. But uh, Axios cited a source as saying that all guests will be required to be vaccinated and will be required to be tested for COVID-19. The party, they also point out, will be held outdoors And Martha's Vineyard is not considered an area of substantially high risk. Uh, What is not being reported is whether guests will have to wear masks. The uh, party will reportedly be held at the Obama's $12 million oceanfront home. And Pearl Jam is expected to play. Uh, However, Joe Biden will not be there, according to the White House. I don't think it's because of the covid thing but uh the uh, white house says the current president is looking forward to uh meeting up and getting together with the former president very very soon so um by the way speaking of the uh, pandemic if you think the world is ending the best place to be new zealand A new study found that it is the nation with the most favorable starting conditions to survive a global societal collapse. 
<laughs> well, I know I've always wondered about that. Where would be where would be the best place to restart humankind if there were some sort of uh, you know global societal collapse? <laughs> it's kept me awake nights. Uh, the uh, researchers say New Zealand has the best inherent conditions rather than deliberate actions needed to survive the collapsing of society. Uh, Iceland is also right up there. Britain is high on the list. Australia and Ireland. Those are the top five. Common features were they're all island areas that have a relatively low degree of temperature and participation. Er, participation. Low degree of temperature and precipitation variability. So, in other words, the uh, amount of precipitation that you get in those areas is rather predictable from one year to the next, making it uh, uh, rather uh, predictable, viable place to restart humanity. Uh, study authors also say these locations would also have the greatest likelihood of relatively stable conditions being buffered and persisting in response to climate change scenarios. For the 21st century, New Zealand considered the ideal location due to it having abundant renewable energy, including geothermal and hydroelectric resources, its agricultural characteristics, characteristics and its low population density. So there you go. Uh, although that low population thing probably would be out the window if... <laughs> If every remaining human being after a societal collapse would go to New Zealand to try and restart. So, but that might throw a monkey wrench in that. But, you know, it's, it's uh, just something uh, interesting to start off your Monday morning. <laughs> Here's something good uh, as you head into a new week. A new study finds that eating foods high in flavonoids can help lessen the risk of cognitive decline as we age. In other words, your fruits, your vegetables, particularly f uh, fruits, oranges, strawberries, blueberries, all known to be high in flavonoids. The author of this study, Dr. Walter Willett, the Harvard University, says that flavonoids are compounds filled with antioxidants and are found in most fruits and veggies. The data shows that people who consume 600 milligrams of flavonoids every day had a 20% reduced risk of cognitive decline as opposed to people who consumed uh, just 150 milligrams each day. He adds that in addition to eating these foods, it's important to prioritize a well-balanced lifestyle, which should be full of physical exercise and, uh, of course, don't smoke. But uh, anyway, they say, so eat plenty of fruits. And I have a feeling, uh, the study does not say this, the report does not say this specifically, but I would guess that my fruity pebbles are not an acceptable substitute for the real world. Probably not. And uh, because we always have to have something to worry about, uh, another invasive species has been recorded in Florida. Now, this is a strange legless amphibian that is nicknamed that this is uh, native to Colombia and Venezuela, but it is found and been documented uh, in Miami. Now they found this uh, in Colombia and Venezuela, where it is uh, native. They nickname it the penis snake. I kid you not. That's not, it's not really a snake. It's a legless amphibian uh, technically called a Cassilian. I think is how you pronounce it. Uh, they range in size from a few inches to five feet long and have extremely poor eyesight, but they have a pair of sensory tentacles located between their eyes and their nostril that help the creature detect its food, which it then eats with dozens of needle-like teeth. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission says the animals consume worms, termites, small frogs, and lizards, and the top Herpetology manager at the Florida Museum says very little is known about these animals in the wild, but there is nothing particularly dangerous about them, and they don't appear to be serious predators. They will probably eat small animals and then get, get eaten by larger ones. So this is probably just another non-native species, species in the South Florida mix. 
So they don't seem overly concerned. This is a this is a legless amphibian weird sort of thing that has tentacles and needle dozens of needle like teeth. And they say not much is known about these animals in the wild, but there's nothing particularly dangerous about them. Well, how do you know how how exactly do you know that? If nothing much is known about them, how do you know they're not dangerous? I think I will. Uh, no, thanks. I, I don't want to take my chances. I, <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, so anyway, there's your uh, daily dose of things that uh, we should be <laughs> we should be worried about. Uh, the murder hornets weren't enough. Now, <laughs> now we've got. I kid you not. They call it the penis snake. That's what they. That's what they call it in uh, South America, where they. Uh, South and Central America, where it is native. <clears throat> but nothing to worry about. <laughs> nothing to worry about. There you go. Some of the most interesting and buzzworthy stories to get your Monday morning started. This is ONN. I'm Dave James on the Ohio News Network. After much delay, senators in Washington have unveiled their $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure investment and jobs act. Ohio Republican Rob Portman, who was instrumental in getting the deal through, says it includes $550 billion in new spending. It's good for the factory worker in Ohio who makes things that need to be transported. We make tanks in Ohio. We make cars in Ohio. We make washing machines. They go all over the world. Our ports, our land ports, and our seaports are inefficient and backed up. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says he expects passage within days, but it still would have to pass the House. A Cleveland City Council member has been convicted of federal theft, tax, and other charges and could face up to 10 years in prison. Cleveland.com reports a jury in Akron deliberated for four hours Friday before returning its verdicts on 15 counts against 75-year-old Kenneth Johnson. His longtime assistant, 63-year-old Garnell Jameson, was convicted of 11 counts. Johnson stood accused of filing $127,000 in false expense reports to the city over a nine-year period. Johnson testified at trial the reports were accurate, and he had worked hard for his constituents for 40 years. Daniel Barnett... ONN News. Columbus native Simone Biles says she will compete in balance beam finals tomorrow in the Tokyo Olympics after removing herself from all other events due to mental health issues. I'm Dave James on the Ohio News Network. Well, as you may be aware, the health insurance marketplace, healthcare.gov, is now offering private health uh, insurance to anyone who is either receiving or already received unemployment benefits in 2021, kind of a, a special enrollment period. There have been a uh, number of iterations of this over the course of the past year, the course of the pandemic. Dr. LaShawn McIver is with us this morning to talk about everything you need to know with the deadline coming up here in uh, just a couple of weeks, the 15th of this month. And uh, Dr. McIver, who are we talking about that should be taking advantage of this uh, uh, special enrollment period and uh, be looking at those options that are available? So anyone who's looking for health insurance at this time should absolutely take advantage of this opportunity to look for coverage and see if they qualify for financial assistance. So during this special enrollment period, you won't need to provide any documentation of a qualifying life event, such as, um, for example, like a loss of job or birth of a child. And as you noted, uh, as of July 1st, if you have received any type of unemployment benefits in 2021, you're eligible for even additional um, financial assistance. So that's the next question. And, and so we talk about the uh, target audience first. What about that financial ex, uh, assistance? Because, again, this was something we talked about several months ago, extension of the enrollment deadline originally and with the pandemic and so on. That has been uh, expanded for consumers as well? Yes. So the COVID relief law provided several provisions um, to, to provide financial assistance. Uh, as of July 1st, there are special provisions in place that will benefit people who are unemployed um, or, or who have received um, unemployment compensation during this year. Mm -hmm. But if you, if you are uninsured and employed, you can still apply for insurance if you are in need of insurance through the health insurance marketplace. 
a very important point that we're not specifically and exclusively speaking uh, to those who are currently unemployed. So how do we uh, apply for not just the coverage, but then the financial assistance as well? What is going to take us through the process here? So uh, you would start with healthcare.gov to initiate the application process and to see what type of financial assistance you may qualify for. But if you have listeners that may need additional assistance, we have a marketplace call center and they can call 1-800-318-2596 to get assistance. And we have help at that number for in over 150 languages and it is open seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So is there, uh, for the financial assistance part, is there a, a separate step or a, a first step that we need to take before we go to healthcare.gov and a, apply for coverage? Or is that all done at the same time, at the same spot? So the first step is going to healthcare.gov to okay. initiate the process. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, for those who uh, do apply for uh, this uh, coverage through the marketplace, uh, is coverage instant? Is there a waiting period? So the special enrollment period ends August 15th. And if they sign up before the August 15th deadline, their coverage will start September 1st. Okay. So September 1st coverage begins. What about for those who are saying, well, wait a minute, I already did this. Do I have to go back again? Should I uh, come back and update my information? Is there uh, maybe more financial assistance available, better plans, so on and so forth? Even if you currently have health insurance through, health insurance through the, health, the health insurance marketplace, you should still go back. We're finding that four out of five currently enrolled individuals are finding plans for $10 a month or less and as a result of this uh, newly expanded financial assistance. And for a typical family of four, their average premium is going down from $400 a month to about $163 a month. Mm. So, you know, if you have a plan already, you should still go back and re, uh, go through the application process. And, and because that uh, savings is substantial. And then that, uh, we're talking about those uh, premiums and uh, as examples, uh, and the financial assistance, does that uh, remain in place just through the end of the calendar year? Or, uh, you know, does this take us through to the next uh, open enrollment period? So for, for individuals who are unemployed and taking advantage of the uh, financial expanded financial assistance. Mm-hmm. It will last. Th- this coverage will last through, or the funding for this coverage will last through the end of 2021. Okay. Um, for others who are uninsured, um, who may qualify for financial assistance, there's some assistance will be available through next year. So, uh, the July 1st provision is specifically for people who received unemployment compensation this year, and okay. they all have health insurance coverage through the end of this year, but okay. the, the funding itself gotcha. goes into next year. So again, uh, that is the uh, audience that we're speaking to specifically. But again, just to reiterate, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean uh, exclusively for those who are currently unemployed, just those uh, who were uh, before uh, July 1st. So uh, something to keep in mind there. And again, the deadline just a couple of weeks away. Uh, you mentioned the website, healthcare.gov is the uh, place to go to get things started. And, and again, just to reiterate, there is uh, h- additional help uh, for those who may be confused uh, by all of this, because I'm sure we haven't cleared up all of the questions just yet. Healthcare.gov is where, where they should start. And, and I'll just clarify one point that if you have received unemployment benefits or are eligible to receive them this year, uh-huh. you would qualify for the, the special funding. So it's not just those before July 1st, but as of July 1st, this gotcha. additional funding okay. is now available. Right, get that uh, clarification in there. Bottom line, we will link up to it on our webpage uh, with that August 15th deadline looming. Uh, it is something to uh, be aware of. Dr. LaShawn McIver uh, with the uh, health insurance marketplace, healthcare.gov, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services with us uh, this morning. Dr. McIver, thanks very much for taking the time. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. So, as we were mentioning, the healthcare.gov open enrollment period for those who lost coverage due to uh, pandemic-related furlough or layoff ends soon. Uh, That coming up on August 15th, perhaps an even more immediate concern 
for those still reeling from the financial impact of the pandemic is the expiration of the federal eviction moratorium over the weekend. Joining us this morning is Hope House Development Director Lori Poland. And uh, Lori, is there any way to have any idea or any educated guess as to how many people uh, in our area may be affected uh, by the uh, expiration of that moratorium may have been been holding on uh, to their homes, unable to pay uh, for, you know, some period of time that now be maybe facing uh, e- eviction. I mean, do you have any way of any idea how many folks might be impacted by that? Well, Chris, uh, good morning. Thanks for having me this morning. Uh, short of, you know, personally connect, connecting with landlords, there's really no way to predict how many folks are behind. I can tell you that in 2020, Hope House went from serving 44 landlords to working with 122 uh, regarding the eviction prevention. So we know that a good portion of landlords have been connecting with resources uh, to prevent evictions. Now, again, you know, there were about 4,100 rentals in Hancock County. So we serve just a portion of those. Right. And it doesn't mean that all rental um, units are behind. Right. Um, but we feel like a good portion of those um, who were uh, on that, um, yeah, who needed assistance because of COVID, we were able to assist them. Yeah. Along with many other agencies in Hancock County. And uh, I, I heard one uh, housing expert uh, over the uh, weekend say one of the national news programs that you could be facing a tsunami of people, you know, being evicted from their homes. Uh, clearly, from the number that you just mentioned, there are a lot more uh, landlords who are dealing with. Uh, the issue of tenants who were behind uh, on their rent. And I know the demand uh, uh, for your services from individuals who were struggling was much, much greater last year, uh, as one might expect. That's correct, Chris. Well, you know, in addition to our regular housing program, rental assistance programs, we served about two and a half times the number of individuals Wow. in 2020 than we did in 2019. But I think we're in kind of a unique position. Um, I've been reading some information about national statistics about eviction prevention and about the monies that were awarded uh, to different states and uh, localities. And it's amazing to me that there are, are areas who did not use the money they were awarded. Mm-hmm. Um, we uh, at Hope House used all of the CARES Act money um, along with the other agencies that we uh, collaborate with um, we were very proactive in getting that money uh, to landlords uh, to prevent those evictions. So we don't really expect a huge surge uh, today or in the coming week. We may see a small uptick, but mm-hmm. uh, our case managers were very proactive in reaching out to landlords to say, you know, if you have someone that is affected by COVID and needs some assistance in paying their rent, please have them come in, have them talk to us, and let's see what we can do to prevent this um, problem. because. You know, as we know, when a a tenant is not paying their rent, uh, it also falls on the landlord to cover that gap. They have they still have expenses to cover. And we wanted to make sure that we did our best to try to avoid this kind of trickling down to the landlord and his or her family. Yeah, that that is certainly uh, an important point, because a lot of folks are lamenting uh, the end of the eviction moratorium. And in Congress, they're talking about uh, possibly extending it even more. But uh, it is a fair point, an important point that landlords, uh, the longer this goes, uh, are potentially put into a world of hurt, because as you said, they still have expenses. In many cases, they have mortgages to pay without uh, that that rental income coming in, so uh, this impacts uh, all sides. Uh, and I, I th- one of the questions I was going to ask, as you were addressing a little bit earlier, uh, whether that uh, financial assistance, as you mentioned, nationwide, there are a lot of areas where uh, the money that was supposed to help with the you know, the, that, that rental assistance uh, simply was not distributed or was not distributed uh, efficiently. You have. Uh, been more proactive uh, with that. Does that mean that for anyone who is struggling, that there is, uh, is there any left, uh, any other uh, assistance for someone who is struggling? What kind of options do they have at this point? 
Yes, um, we do have some money left for folks affected by COVID and that may be behind on their rent. Um, there is a process. You would meet with one of our case managers, uh, do what we call an intake, which is a series of questions to see whether you qualify or not. And um, also, there is some CARES Act money still available through the Community Action Commission. Mm. Um, and that covers not only rent, but some utilities as well. So there is um, uh, there are a lot of resources available. And again, we live in a unique community where we have deliberate collaboration with other entities so that we can maximize the resources that are here in our community. And I, so I think we, we, like I said, we may see some folks that do need some assistance, but we have been very proactive in distributing that money um, in our community. You know, this is a situation that has impacted the individuals that maybe have not had to deal with this uh, in the past, much like uh, with the uh, food banks, the great demand on food mm-hmm. banks at the height of the uh, pandemic, people uh, needing uh, assistance that maybe have never found themselves in the situation before. Uh, but for those who have struggled in the past and uh, maybe trying to get right back on their feet, finally, then this comes along. How much of a setback is this potentially? Because I'd imagine it's going to be very hard for someone who loses their housing because of all of this to find a new place when you've got an eviction, you know, hanging over your head. Mm-hmm. Right. If one, one thing that this has shown us is that preventing the eviction in the first place removes that barrier at, for folks who get evicted. You know, when you're looking for an apartment, as, as you know, housing is so precious here in Hancock County. Yeah. It's not a local problem. It's actually a national problem. But, you know, rent, rentals are hard to find and affordable rentals here in our community um, can be very difficult. So when you approach a landlord and you you owe back rent, maybe security deposit to another landlord, they're not going to be overly anxious to rent to you. So that's another barrier for folks that have faced barrier after barrier. So preventing that eviction in the first place really has made a lot of sense in helping people move forward. You know, we all know COVID has been a horrible experience for just about everyone. Um, uh, I can't see anyone that says, gosh, I'd love to do this again because it was so much fun, <laughs> right. um, you know, but, um, you know, any barriers that can be removed so people can go back to rebuilding their lives after COVID is just so important. And that's why we feel like the eviction prevention monies that have been given to our community have been so critical in helping to stabilize families that already were in crisis or, as you alluded to, had never been in crisis before because we saw a lot of families who had never needed assistance who all of a sudden, Mm -hmm. now they're in a situation where um, they're home is compromised. Yeah, as evidenced by the uh, huge increase in cases uh, over the past year. So bottom line it here now with the uh, eviction moratorium expiring over the weekend, I would imagine you're kind of taking a deep breath for uh, perhaps a spike in in calls for assistance and what do I do now kind of situations. What would you advise those who find themselves with an eviction notice on the their door here in the next few days. Uh, what is the uh, first step? What do they do? The first step I would say is open that line of communication with your landlord. Talk to your landlord. Find out if they would be willing to work with you to help keep you housed. Um, you if, if you can run, but you can't hide. Kind of. Um, yeah. If you see that eviction notice on your door and you try to hide, that's not going to help you. Be honest. Um, Again, communication is key. Um, Talk to your landlord, see what they're willing to do, if they're willing to work with you. And then if they are, you know, check out your resources. Um, Like I said, we do have some monies available. We do ask you to go through an intake process. Um, So give our office a call at 419-427-2848. Talk to a case manager, see what your options are. Or you could call the Community Action Commission as well. Talk to a representative over there and see what your uh, what they may be able to do for you. Um, if you would get in a situation where legally you're, you've been evicted and you need some assistance, um, there was a lot of information in the career last week. Um, Missy Larocco from Legal Aid had a lot of great suggestions. But then, if it if it to get to that next step, I talk to someone for legal advice if it, that becomes necessary. Don't try to handle this on your own. Go to the. This is what these 
uh, resources in your community are for to help you talk through the situation, find out what help is available so that you can move forward. Because the last thing we want to see is an uptick in the rate of homelessness locally, because again, uh, this becomes a, an even more difficult problem to overcome uh, anytime you have uh, some sort of uh, uptick uh, in this. So the best uh, idea, as you were saying, is to prevent it from happening in the first place. Hope House Development Director Lori Poland with us this morning. We have a link up to their website at ours, goodmornings.net. Lori, thanks very much for the update. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Chris. We interrupt this program to bring you a broken news alert. Today's update on the odd and unusual side of the news is brought to you as a public service, more or less, of Hancock County Veteran Services. Now, this first story in the uh, broken news, um, I mean, it's kind of gross, uh, so I'll forewarn you about that. But what was really interesting uh, in the write-up was, well, I'll I'll get to it. I'll see if you can figure out what alarmed me about this story. <clears throat> in Denver, Colorado's North Park Hill neighborhood, residents have been grossed out by a man who has been seen defecating all over their neighborhood. Uh, one neighbor says she caught the man on surveillance video and then called police. Another neighbor says the man who seems like he is exercising, appears like he's exercising, will suddenly drop his drawers in broad daylight and use an alleyway as his you know, personal toilet to relieve himself. Uh, she said it has happened twice over the past few weeks at the same location. Uh, one other neighbor says this person comes prepared with toilet paper. So it's, I mean, he knows he's going to do this uh, and he doesn't even bother to, to clean up afterwards. The uh, Denver Department of Public Health and Environment says the says of the incident, quote, ordinarily we would investigate, but because of continuing restrictions on our bandwidth from COVID, we must prioritize complaints starting with encampments, then rodents, then alleyways, and then individual feces complaints. With the majority of such complaints, we provide cleanup guidance to property owners on how to safely remove said feces, unquote. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> with a majority of these complaints, how many of these complaints do you get? How, ma- <laughs> how frequently is this happening in Denver, Colorado? What is it <laughs> that's happening in the Mile High City that is causing people to drop their drawers and uh, relieve themselves in public? Is this... A common thing? I just, just the way they worded that with the majority of these complaints, this is what we do. That's, <laughs> you would hope that that would be the only one that they would have. And it's sad to think that there would even be that one <laughs> with the majority of those complaints. Oh, my. <clears throat> Elsewhere in the broken news, our neighbors to the north. Making the broken news today, Canadians, of course, normally known for being very nice, but it seems they are capable of having road rage. Authorities in Ontario say a fight started on the 60 freeway on Wednesday evening had to be broken up by police. Officials, uh, officers say the fight involves several people on the eastbound lanes near Vineyard Avenue. It began with a collision, and then as the drivers were exchanging information, insurance information, a violent brawl broke out. Responding officers tried to calm the individuals involved, but say even while handcuffed, they tried to attack each other. (laughs) Uh, Three people in total were arrested, including a father and son. (laughs) Teach your children well. One officer sustained moderate injuries and was actually taken to the hospital the department now investigating the incident trying to figure out how in the world did this happen in canada <laughs> oh goodness <clears throat> you know bed bugs are they're just a, a horrible thing uh, to have to deal with tough to get rid of and all of that but this is not a way to get rid of them a 31 year old woman in Michigan, Oakland County, Michigan, is recovering after the county sheriff's office says they were called on Tuesday to a reported car fire on Perry Street in Pontiac. <laughs> they arrived to find the woman who said she had had a panic attack after finding bed bugs in her car. In an effort to kill them, she poured rubbing alcohol in the car and set it on fire, <laughs> burning herself. In the process, 
Firefighters extinguished the blaze. No other details available about the woman's condition, but she no longer has bed bugs. That's... I don't know if it killed the bed bugs, but she won't have to worry about them in her car anymore because her car's gone. So. <laughs> That's one way to do it. Not the preferred way, though. Speaking of people having panic attacks, in Yakima, Washington, a man is under arrest after he opened fire on his refrigerator. Uh, the unnamed man told police that he was acting in self-defense and attacking his refrigerator. His story is that people who lived in the basement of the building were trying to kill him. Investigators said that there's no basement at all in his building, but he insists that the people who were living in the basement were trying to kill him. Witnesses told authorities that the man had been loading uh, soda pop uh, into the refrigerator and and one of the cans exploded, and that's what the man mistook for gunfire and began returning fire at the bottom of the refrigerator. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the man was arrested and booked for second-degree unlawful possession of a firearm and unlawful discharge of a firearm. So. <laughs> for, for starters. Okay. <clears throat> And finally, in the uh, broken news, how crazy is this? A professor at Fairfield University has sued a former student because the student complained to the department after flunking her ca class and got the grade changed. Uh, Connecticut, the Connecticut Post reports that law professor Charlene McAvoy served papers to the student and the university claiming she was defamed and the university overstepped its boundaries. The professor was taught at FU since ni FU uh, since 1986, um, and the student was enrolled in her spring 2020 class. Because of the pandemic, the final was done remotely, a final that was worth 100% of the grade. According to the lawsuit, the student, identified as Joseph Moran of New Jersey, did not follow the specific directions on how to return the exam for his law class. The final was to be transmitted via USPS, of which the professor provided each student a prepaid envelope and paid for tracking, saying the final was due by June 12th, but said the tracking would allow her to see if a final was submitted before the due date. Uh, Mr. Moran sent his final in on June 8th, but did not follow instructions to have his envelope tracked. So when it arrived on the 16th, past the deadline, she flunked him. The student ran to the department's chair and said the grade was unfair. And uh, now Ms. Uh, uh, Professor McAvoy agreed to revisit the final and awarded him a C minus. But the student then complained again to the administration. The university agreed the grade was prejudiced and ruled that he had passed the class and thus the lawsuit. The professor is suing, suing the student for defaming uh, besmirching her good name. Ms. McAvoy seeks unspecified damages and wants the state superior court to reverse the student's changed grade. Wow. That'll be a story worth following. Interesting stuff there. There you go. That is uh, today's broken news report. This update on the odd and unusual side of the news brought to you as a public service, more or less. Of Hancock County Veteran Services, we now return you to your regularly scheduled programming. It's the WFIN Virtual Car Show. Get them out, shine them up, and upload a pic of your classic, and we'll post it to WFIN.com for everybody to see. In addition, we'll have an online car show calendar so that you know when and where all the area shows are. It's chrome and horsepower on display online. The WFIN Virtual Car Show and Calendar. Thanks to Details Auto Spa, Loritz Chevrolet Cadillac, and 1330 WFIN and 95.5 FM. Now the uh, daily download this morning. Numbers behind the news and the statistics that shape our lives. Kind of an interesting uh, data here from the uh, U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. Uh, shows that more than half of all U.S. adults are in pain. Uh, more than half, more than 50% of adults suffer from pain, backs, back pain, and leg pain being the most common sources. 
Overall, researchers found nearly 59% of American adults were dealing with pain. They found 39% had back pain, 37% had hip, knee, or foot pain, and nearly one-third had hand, arm, or shoulder pain in the past three months. About 10% suffered from toothaches, and probably not surprisingly, those 65 and older are more likely uh, to suffer from pain. Women, more likely than men. White adults, uh, more likely than uh, uh, minorities, which I thought was kind of interesting. And those with incomes below the federal poverty level were more likely to have pain. That part, not surprising at all, uh, because obviously they'd be less likely to seek out medical attention. But uh, wow, almost two thirds of Americans dealing with chronic pain. Well, here in just a few weeks, the kids are going to be back in class. Emphasize that phrase, back in class. Uh, In-person learning is back, and that means sweatpants are out. And with uh, campuses reopening across the country, students redefining their back-to-school wardrobe by shedding their remote learning loungewear in favor of eye-catching new looks. Beauty and lifestyle expert Grace Gold has... This morning, the season's top back to school trends. Grace, what is your uh, top tip in terms of getting ready for that first day back in person learning this school year? Yes. Well, we're seeing the number of people starting that back to school shopping early. And I'm talking as early as June has nearly doubled this year as compared to 2019 before the pandemic. That tells us that, you know, parents and kids alike are really excited about getting out of the pandemic PJs, getting some (laughs) fresh back to school outfits. We're seeing a big interest in those first day of school outfits. And, you know, we want to also think about vision as our kids return to school. And did you know that nearly four out of five teens, they actually prefer contact lenses over glasses. So addressing those vision correction problems, it really is a must for setting your child up for success at school. But glasses might not be your child's first choice. So a great choice, especially for those first-time wearers, are BioTrue one-day contact lenses created by the eye care experts at Bausch & Lomb. Now, BioTrue one-day daily disposables also allow for flexibility if your teen wants to switch between glasses and contacts. And I really like these contacts because they're unbeaten in moisture. They're easy to insert and remove. They provide clear and comfortable vision all day. Your teen also doesn't have to worry about cleaning and storing them because they'll have a new pair each day. And they can help keep up with your teen's busy lifestyle, help them avoid misplacing and breaking those glasses, which I know is music those parents here. <laughs> Absolutely. So a uh, really important point. Make sure that you get the uh, kids vision checked. Maybe that was something that got put on the back burner last year. Definitely need to make sure you do that before the kids head back to school. It also says here you have some back to school beauty tips to share. Yes. Let's talk about hair because we know the school year can be very hectic. And when you're short on time, that proper shampoo and blow dry, it's out of the question. So in that situation, dry shampoo is really your best friend. And I always keep a bottle of Colab on hand. So Colab has a weightless formula that uses a very fine starch to absorb oil. It refreshes the roots. It leaves your hair looking healthy, clean, and vibrant. And it's uniquely formulated for all hair types, colors, and textures, and leaves no white residue. Now, if you really want to multitask, they've got the Overnight Renew formula. This works while you sleep to absorb oil, detox your hair, and care for your scalp. You basically spray it on, you sleep right on your hair, you wake up with refreshed hair, and I love that it's cruelty-free, paraben-free, and vegan-friendly as well. All right. Uh, Any other trends for Back to School 2021 that you are seeing this year? Yes. So the kids and teens, they want to express their individuality more than ever before in this back to school season. They're getting their ideas from TikTok, big source of inspiration. And on TikTok, we are seeing hair color all over the spectrum. I'm talking about pinks and blues and purples. And a fun way you can do that with your kids is to get clip-in hair extensions. So they're less than $10 at most retailers. You can do a streak of purple, pink, and blue without dyeing your hair and having that kind of commitment. You know, the uh, other great part about that is, you know how uh, kids' uh, tastes change from practically one day to the next. This way you don't commit to something for (laughs) the long term. You can uh, switch it out pretty quickly when uh, when their tastes change. 
Uh, some great stuff there. Beauty, uh, wellness, lifestyle expert Grace Gold uh, talking back to school trends. Where do we get more information? Sure, you can visit any of these brands on their home pages. They also have Facebook pages. Again, I talked about the BioTrue One Day Daily Disposable Contact Lenses and the Collab Dry Shampoo. Grace, thanks very much for taking the time. We appreciate it. Thank you. Happy back to school, everyone. And that will put a wrap on our podcast for today. Thanks again to all of our guests for joining us on the program. Remember, you can get more information about all of the topics that we talk about at our webpage, that is goodmornings.net. Coming up tomorrow on the program, a proposed solar farm out near Arcadia has prompted strong pushback among some area residents, but the industry says concerns and fears of nearby residents and township officials is misplaced. We'll take a closer look. Till tomorrow morning, that is Good Mornings for this morning. Now that you've had a good morning, go on out and make it a good day. We'll catch you back here tomorrow.